SCP-173. It's one of the most iconic anomalies ever contained by the SCP Foundation. This next snapping Site-19 celebrity is known and feared by everyone who works at the Foundation since being contained in 1993. Its nubby concrete hands metaphorically and quite literally stained with the blood of countless people. But this mostly immobile oddity wasn't always a resident of Site-19, and the story of how exactly it ended up there, and more importantly why, is far more ridiculous, insane, and downright terrifying than you could ever imagine. So buckle up, SCP fans, this is the dramatic tale of how this homicidal piece of modern art ended up at the SCP Foundation's largest containment site. To give you an idea of just how weird this origin story is, we're gonna have to leap forward to the year of 2045. We know what you're thinking. Isn't this a prequel? How can it take place in the future? Sit tight, folks. It'll all make sense in the end. Site 91 is where we lay our scene, under the watchful eyes of Site Director Dr. James Long, a senior researcher with level 4 security clearance, the second highest at the Foundation. Dr. Long had given decades of devotion and his expertise to the Foundation. He was a proud man who wore his life of service to the containment cause as a badge of honor. After years of dodging death while researching some of the most dangerous anomalies that Site-91 had to offer, he had ascended to the rank of Site Director which represented the culmination of his life's work, and in his new position of power, he'd only proved himself further, running a tight ship and reducing the number of containment breaches across the board. Nobody could say that Dr. Long wasn't extremely talented at his job, which is why he was so confused when he received an email from Alexandra Nala, an administrative assistant working directly for the O5 Council. It was the type of email that no site director ever wanted to receive. Dr. Long was being told that, with no input or oversight from him, the majority of Site-91's anomalies were going to be taken to an undisclosed location for safer containment. The list contained nearly every meaningful detainee contained on the site, including, of course, SCP-173. This particular anomaly had been contained at the site for 37 years after being delivered there in 2008. Dr. Long had devised a perfect method to minimize containment breaches in that time, creating a sprinkler system within the chamber that washes away the waste products produced by 173, reducing the need for risky human contact. But that didn't matter. Despite Dr. Long's loyalty and efficacy in serving the SCP Foundation, the decision had already been made, with no chance of reversing it. According to Nala, the motion to remove most of Site-91's anomalies had received unanimous approval from the O5 Council, and the operations for the transfer would be commandeered by the Department of Extra Universal Affairs, headed by Senior Agent Sven Kish. Dr. Long was both upset and confused. He was producing some of the best results across the entire Foundation, so why were they taking away all of his anomalies? Did someone on the O5 Council have it out for him? Dr. Long replied to Nala asking if, considering how severe the relocation operation was going to be, whether he could get more information on where the anomalies were being moved to, and why. He felt that, at the very least, he was owed some answers on this. Nala and her superiors didn't feel quite the same way. She replied that Dr. Long sadly didn't have the clearance to know any of the operation's particulars. This information was reserved for those with level 5 clearance, and members of the multi-universal department. All that Dr. Long needed to do was stay out of the way, and everything would be taken care of for him. But that wasn't enough for Dr. Long. He needed to know more. He needed to understand why this seemingly random decision had been made. Realizing that Nala and the O5 Council were a dead end as far as information was concerned, he instead reached out to the next best thing, Senior Agent Sven Kish, the member of the Department of Extra Universal Affairs who was spearheading the relocation mission. Dr. Long implored the agent to give him extra information on where all the Site-91 anomalies were being moved, and why they were being moved in the first place. Predictably, he was once again stonewalled, being told that any information regarding the project was above his level of clearance. In a move that seemed decidedly spiteful, Agent Kish signed off by saying that he looked forward to seeing Dr. Long at Site-91. And not long after that, 
He did. Agent Kish along with a huge number of agents and task force members from the multi-U department arrived on site, bearing state-of-the-art containment equipment. An exasperated Dr. Long wasn't able to glean any more information from this experience. The multi-U agents were ruthlessly efficient, transferring the lion's share of the anomalies into temporary containment and transporting them off-site within a few hours. By the time they were done, Dr. Long and his staff were left with one of the most desolate and empty containment sites on the Foundation's books. Here was Dr. Long, with decades of service and climbing the organizational ladder, only to be left as a glorified babysitter for a handful of low-priority anomalous items. It all felt like a cruel joke. After several days of nothing happening in the now incredibly uneventful Site-91, a bored Dr. Long reached out to a friend of his, researcher Nurul Shafiqa Binte Ahmad Ibrahim, whom he called by the nickname Shaq, to vent his frustrations. She commiserated, sharing her sympathy for his suddenly much less exciting working conditions, but saying that at least the job should be a little less lethal now. Shaq didn't know it yet, but on this particular point, she was terribly wrong. Dr. Long shared his theory that perhaps some sites were being consolidated so the Foundation could save money, and that this would lead to layoffs. Shaq essentially told him that he was worrying too much. The reality was that Dr. Long had some very good reasons to be worried. His problem was that he hadn't been worrying about the right things. In Foundation Containment Area 179, something awful was brewing. As usual, guards posted around SCP-2317, an old door containing a portal to another world, waited while Foundation staff and D-classes performed the standard Procedure 220 Calabasas ritual within. They were dealing with one of the most dangerous anomalies in the entire universe. But even then, after decades of service, one can be numb to such things. Suddenly, without warning, the door opened and a terrified Foundation researcher tumbled out, panting heavily, eyes bulging in existential horror. He screamed the words that he long hoped would never be spoken in his or even his children's lifetime. It happened! The chains have broken! The Devourer is free! The siren sounded, and an alert spread across the entire Foundation database. SCP-2317 is compromised. SCP-2317-K, the Devourer of Worlds, is free. If the creature escapes Area 179, an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario is basically assured so all efforts will be taken to make sure that the creature does not escape at any cost, and they really did mean any cost. The old wooden door of SCP-2317 splintered as an immense scaly hand sprang forth and clawed a wave of devastation throughout the containment chamber. Guards were dispatched in the hundreds with heavy weaponry to buy some time, firing at the devourer. A beast the size of a mountain rose from the ground, staring at the terrified humans below with its one gigantic red eye. It couldn't even feel the bullets, explosives, or incendiary and laser weaponry being used on it. The monster just shrugged it off and murdered nearly all of its attackers with one swipe of its claw. In a final desperate act hoping to kill or at least slow down the beast, Staff at Area 179 made the ultimate sacrifice and detonated the entire on-site nuclear arsenal. The explosion disintegrated the entire facility in an instant and unleashed a radioactive shockwave that carried destruction for miles. But it wasn't enough. SCP-2317-K walked out of the mushroom cloud without a scratch on it, ready to show the human world what real destruction meant. At this point, the battle was already effectively lost. But the Foundation refused to go down without a fight. They dispatched all available mobile task forces, including Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown, a heavily armed battalion strength task force created to combat the biggest and most extensive threats imaginable. And it wasn't even just the Foundation. True existential threats have a way of uniting people, as the GOC and even the Chaos Insurgency temporarily put aside their differences to take the fight to the Devourer. But would any of it be enough? Barrages of cruise missiles and ICBMs did nothing to halt the Devourer's assault, as it rampaged destroying towns and cities at first, then regions, then whole nations. Swarms of scrambled jets and helicopters were knocked out of the sky with casual swipes. The creature bulldozed over landscapes teeming with tanks and heavy artillery vehicles. It snapped aircraft carriers in half as it waded from ocean to ocean, systematically destroying everything in its path. Even satellite-mounted orbital cannons and the heavy energy weapons of MTF Tau-5, also known as Samsara, did nothing to phase the Devourer. 
it was finally coming to fruition. The dreaded XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, and none of the Foundation's expertise, advanced technology, or limitless resources could do anything to stop it. They aided in evacuation efforts, getting as many people as they could out of harm's way as the Devourer rampaged and destroyed, but even that was doing little more than borrowing time. Eventually, the Devourer would destroy all of them. There would be nothing left. And all Dr. James Long could do was watch helplessly from an almost empty Site-91, waiting for the tide of destruction to reach him. Of course, other Foundation employees, most prominently senior agents Sven Kish and the Multi-U department, had other concerns. All they needed to do was archive data for extraction. Extraction to where, you ask, seeing as the world seems to be at its end here? Well, Universe 7392 Epsilon Blue Lima, otherwise known as our universe, circa 1993. The Foundation works across the multiverse, and an XK-class end of the world scenario in one universe really isn't necessarily a problem in others. On orders of the O5 Council, Agent Kish and his men are charged with extracting data and valuable anomalies like SCP-173 from doomed universes. O5 knew that Dr. Long's universe, Universe 5643 Gamma Orange Delta, was due for an apocalyptic visit from the Devourer of Worlds any day now. That's why the multi-U team went in to extract everything worth saving. Dr. Long and the millions of other level 4 and below employees of that universe's foundation were never told of their impending doom. After all, that sort of thing could probably lead to unnecessary stress, and what they don't know won't hurt them, until of course, it does. In 1993, these anomalous doomed universe SCPs were divided amongst our universe's various applicable containment sites. SCP-173, as you already know, ended up in Site-19, but sadly for the people working there, all the actual data files on this entry's file were lost in translation, so as far as they knew, 173 was little more than a big weird statue with apparently dangerous properties. Upon first placing it in its containment chamber in Site-19 Euclid Wing, Foundation legend Dr. Bright, unaware of just what he had here, assigned Dr. William Moto to begin research on the entity. He recommended that the researcher bring two D-classes for testing. When Dr. Moto was faced with the anomalous entity's blank file, he gave a sigh and began to write something in its description box. Move to Site-19, 1993. Origin is, as of yet, unknown. Wasn't that a delightful little tale? Now we know how SCP-173 made its way into Site-19, and what our own universe may have to look forward to in 2045. So remember, if you ever see Agent Sven Kish planning a transfer of anomalies out of your sight, maybe consider using some of that PTO, and maybe consider putting a down payment on a nice, cozy apocalypse bunker over in Iceland. Know of other tales you'd like to see us cover? Let us know down in the comments below. Now go check out SCP-001 When Day Breaks, and SCP-1730 What Happened to Site-13, the full story compilation for more terrifying tales from the SCP Foundation.